Let's pray. Father God, thank You for this opportunity to come and to hear Your Word being preached. Please bless the message. Please bless Pastor. Please open our hearts and our ears to Your words and help us keep distractions to a minimum. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, well, we're there in 1 Timothy chapter number 5. I'd like you to look down at verse number 25, 1 Timothy chapter 5. I'm sorry, verse number 22. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse number 22. The Bible says, Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins, keep thyself pure. In this chapter and in this verse specifically, the context is about the ordination of a leader. Here specifically, Paul is telling Timothy about spiritual leadership. He talks about bringing a man into the authority or the leadership of a church. And he says, you don't want to just do that flippantly. He says, lay hands suddenly on no man. Talking about the ordination of a man. And when someone is, has their hands laid on to be a pastor, what they're doing is they're basically, the person who's laying hands on them is approving of that individual. Is saying, I approve of the leadership of this person. This person is who they say they are. They're right. They're righteous. And when you lay hands on someone, you're basically approving of their leadership. Here, Paul is telling Tim Timothy, hey, be very careful about laying hands suddenly on just anyone. He says, neither be partake of other men's sins, keep thyself pure. Now, to really understand the verse, you got to look at it in reverse. The goal is to keep thyself pure. That ought to be all of our goals. Our goal is to walk with God, to live righteously, to be pleasing to God. And he says, the goal is to keep yourself pure. So he says, here's how you do it. Make sure you're not in sin and make sure you're not a partaker of other men's sin. You say, well, how can I take part in someone else's sin? He says, here's how you do it. When you lay hands suddenly on someone, when you give authority to someone, when you endorse someone or approve of someone. And here he's talking about spiritual leadership, but there's a principle we can learn here from the Bible that God says, whenever you approve of a leader, you better make sure you know who you're approving of because whatever sins they commit or they bring, you will be held responsible for them. He says, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins, keep thyself pure. You say, why are you... I'm talking about this. Well, this morning, I'm preaching a very specific sermon. And I want to give you the title of the sermon this morning. The title of the sermon is, Why Christians Should Not Vote in the 2016 Presidential Election. Let me say it again. Why Christians Should Not Vote in the 2016 Presidential Election. I already lost some of you, and you already stopped listening. But listen to me. I don't, I don't preach a lot of political issues at Verity Baptist Church, but I'm also not ashamed to, because you know what? The Bible talks about everything. God gives us instructions for everything. God gives us instructions for uh, picking leaders. And I don't believe, and I'm going to prove it to you from the Bible this morning, that a Bible-believing Christian could vote for either candidate this Tuesday, whether it's Hillary, Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, and have a clear conscience before God and be right with God. And I'm going to show you that from the Bible, and I don't believe that any Christian ought to be endorsing or accepting or approving of either one of these candidates. Amen. And let me go ahead and say this, because people are going to be like, well, you're not allowed to preach. Look, first of all, let me say this. At Verity Baptist Church, we're not 501c3, all right? So don't come at me with your little 501c3, you can't, I don't care, number one. But number two, even if we were, here's what the law says. You're not allowed to endorse a candidate. Guess what? I'm not endorsing either candidate. I'm telling you, you, I'm telling you, biblically and scripturally, you ought to abstain from the election this year, and it's wrong for you to lay your hands on either Hillary or Donald Trump, because you'll be partaking of both of their sins. And I'm going to prove that to you from the Bible, and, you know, here's all I ask. Let me, let me give you a couple of things, all right? Who's ever heard the, the, you know, WWJD? You know all these liberals like to walk around with their little bracelets, WWJD, what would Jesus do, all right? Let me, give you, here, let me give you a new phrase for this week, okay? It's WWJVF. Who would Jesus vote for? I want you to ask yourself this question. Would the Lord Jesus Christ cast a ballot for Hillary Clinton? Would the Lord Jesus Christ cast a ballot for Donald Trump? Because look, aren't we Christians? Aren't we supposed to be following in the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ? Aren't we supposed to be patterning ourselves after him? So here's, here's all I want to ask. Would Jesus vote for Hillary Clinton? Would Jesus vote for Donald Trump? You ought to ask yourself this question. Let me say this before we get started. Keep an open mind. Because I've already offended several of you. 
And here's the thing with this type of sermon is I can't win. Because those of you who like Hillary, you're going to be mad at me. Those of you who like Donald Trump, you're going to be mad at me. Those of you who don't like politics, you're going to be mad at me because I'm preaching a political sermon. All right? So look, I'm going to make all of you mad this morning, so just pay attention. Here's all I'm asking. Acts 17.11 says this. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Here's all I'm asking you to do this morning. I, look, if I convince you or don't convince you, that's between you and God. My job is to preach the whole counsel of God. My job is to preach everything the Bible uh, says and to help try to help you uh, with the Bible. Here's all I ask. Go to every reference this morning with me. Look at what the Bible says. Not your preconceived idea, not your political spin. Just look at what the Bible says and ask yourself this question, who would Jesus vote for? And I'm going to pick on both candidates. So if you think, oh, he's picking on Hillary because he likes Trump. No, I'm not. Okay, I'm going to start with Hillary, but I'm going to get on Trump here in a minute. But let me start with this. Why no Bible-believing Christian should cast a vote for Hillary Clinton. Uh, you're there in 1 Timothy. Do me a favor. Keep your place in 1 Timothy because we're going to come back to it. But go with me to the book of Jeremiah. And, you know, the fact that I even have to talk about why no Christian should be voting for Hillary Clinton is absurd in and of itself. But I'm just, I'm, I'm going to teach it to you because it just needs to be taught. There, there's like a thousand reasons why no Bible-believing Christian should ever support Hillary Clinton. But I'm just going to give you, you know... S- Three of the, just the most obvious and probably the most important reasons why no uh, Christian ought to support Hillary Clinton. Jeremiah chapter 1, look down at verse number 4. If you, if you find those major uh, books of the, of the prophets, you've got Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Go to Jeremiah chapter 1, look at verse number 4. This is a very famous passage, Jeremiah 1 and verse 4. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, this is Jeremiah speaking. Notice what God said to Jeremiah, look at verse 5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. The Bible tells us that God had a, had, had, had a knowledge of Jeremiah and had a purpose for Jeremiah and had a plan for Jeremiah before he was even formed. The Bible says, he says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And listen to me. You say, why should no Christian vote for Hillary Clinton? Here's why. Because she's an abortionist. Because she believes it's okay to go into the womb and take the life of a child. She's even, she's even fine with partial birth abortion. Do you understand what that means? Where a child is allowed to be partially birthed, <laughs> partially born, and then killed. You know, the Bible says, lay not your hands on, lay, lay your hands on, on no man. Neither be partake of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. And if you cast a ballot for Hillary Clinton, who thinks it's fine to abort and kill children, you know what you're doing? You're taking part in that sin. You're conspiring to take the lives of, we're told, 3,000 children every day are being aborted today. And listen, God, it wasn't just Jeremiah. Every child in the womb, before they are formed, God has a plan. God has a purpose. God has a desire for that child. He loves that child. And it's murder, it's murder to end the life after conception, it's murder to end the life in the womb. And the most obvious reason why no Christian ought to ever vote for Hillary Clinton is because she believes in abortion. Because she's a murderer. Because she's a killer. You say, I didn't know Hillary Clinton was an abortionist. Where have you been? I mean, if you're that clueless to the political system, do, do everyone a favor. Don't vote for any reason, you know, that you've been a little more educated. Let me tell you about Hillary Clinton's position. Hillary Clinton takes the, stand, the standard Democratic Party line on abortion. She is against efforts to ban the procedure after 20 weeks of pregnancy. She opposes state legislation that increases regulation of abortion providers. She has criticized conservative efforts to cut off government funding for Planned Parenthood because they provide abortion services. Planned Parenthood is one of, is one of the most wicked institutions in our country. I mean, ki- killing children and selling their body parts. And here's what Hillary Clinton said about Planned Parenthood at an event in June 2016. She said, I've been proud to stand with Planned Parenthood for a long time, and as president, I will always have your back. 
This is a woman that literally there are Christians who are saying, well, it's got just anyone but Trump. Really? A murderer? A killer? An abortionist? You know, no Christian ought to vote for Hillary Clinton. Here's why. Because she's an abortionist. Go to 2 uh, Kings chapter 24. Keep your place in Jeremiah. Do me a favor. Keep your finger there. You ought to have your place in 1 Timothy. You ought to have your place in Jeremiah. And go to 2 Kings. If you can find the one and two books in the Old Testament, you got 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. 2 Kings chapter number 20. And no one in this church has came up to me and told me that they're voting for Hillary Clinton. But, you know... You just got to preach this thing. I mean, pe people listen to my sermons online, and there are so many people out there that just have the dumbest views about Christianity and what the Bible teaches. No Christian ought to ever support an abortionist for any reason, ever. 2 Kings 24, look at verse 1. Notice what the Bible says. 2 Kings 24, verse 1. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. This is talking about when Nebuchadnezzar, God used Nebuchadnezzar to bring judgment upon the nation of Judah. You say, why did he do that? Look at verse 2. And the Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldeans, and bands of the Syrians, and bands of the Moabites, and bands of the children of Ammon. And sent them against Judah to destroy it, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servants the prophet. Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah, to remove them out of his sight. Why? Notice why. For the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he did. Who was Manasseh? Manasseh was a king. What was Manasseh's major sin that he was known for? Sacrificing and killing babies. Notice verse 4. And also, don't miss this, and also for the innocent blood, talking about the babies, the blood that was shed of children, for the innocent blood that he shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood. Notice what the Bible says, which the Lord would not pardon. Here's what's interesting about this. Manasseh ended up getting right with God. Later in his life, Manasseh actually got right with God. But you know what? The Bible says that God would not pardon the sins of the nation and he brought judgment against them because he just would not look the other way when they had shed so much innocent blood. And I'm here to tell you, judgment is coming upon America. God is not just going to turn his face and look the other way when we are literally killing 3,000 children a day. Every day. Every 24 hours, 3,000 children, we're told, are being murdered in the womb. You think God's just going to look away? There's a Nebuchadnezzar coming to America. Did you know that? Right. Right. A Nebuchadnezzar came to, 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 to Judah as a punishment for the, the sh blood that they had shed. There's a Nebuchadnezzar coming to America. You know what her name is? <laughs> it, it makes sense that we'd have Nebuchadnezzar ruling over Babylon, USA. And, and, and Christians today are like, oh no, we got to pray that God bless America. Why would we pray, pray that God blesses a country that's murdering children, that's just, you know, that's just leading the world in filth and perverseness? We have a president who has an agenda to bring, you know, equal rights for all these homos and perverts all over the world. And we're supposed to pray. Look, if Hillary Clinton gets elected, America's gone what she deserves. And God will not just look by. God will not just turn his face. As in, he said, look, look down at the Bible. Look at what he said. Look at the last part of verse 4. Which the Lord would not pardon. What were they doing? Killing children. What were they doing? Abort, aborting babies. Killing children. He said, well, it was after birth. That's even worse. I mean, I, I think it's even worse to do it in the womb. I mean, the womb ought to be the safest place for a child to be. And today, it's one of the most dangerous places for the... You say, why should no Christian support Hillary Clinton? Here's why. She's an abortionist. Why should no Christian support Hillary Clinton? Here's why. She's a proponent of the LGBTQXYZ mafia. She's a huge homo proponent. You don't have to go there. I preached a lot on it. Leviticus 20, 13, still in the Bible. It says, If a man also lie with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. That's what the Bible says. And you know what Christians today want to get all hung up about? Whether or not they're allowed to go into the, each other's bathrooms. You know what's funny about that? God doesn't mention anything about whether they should go into each other's bathroom. God just plays the death penalty on that sin. 
And God's perfect, righteous government, when he was in charge, he said, they shall surely be put to death. You say, you're still on that? I'm never going to stop preaching that. I don't care if our insurance drops us. I don't care if they refuse us a building. I don't care if they, if they sue me, if they persecute me. I will preach the Bible. It's wicked. It's sin. It's an abomination before God. And you've got Hillary Clinton, who's their champion, who's their superstar. Hillary Clinton, in, in April of 2015, she, uh, on Twitter, she wrote, Every loving couple and family deserves to be recognized and treated equally under the laws of our nation. Hashtag love must win. Hashtag love can't wait. And she, she's getting endorsed by all these LGBTQ people by all these LGBTQ communities. Listen to me. You say, well, why, why shouldn't we vote for, for Hillary Clinton? Here's why. Because she's a murderer. Because she's an abortionist. Here's why. Because she is the champion of the LGBTQ community and movement. And the Bible says, lay hands suddenly on no man or woman. Neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. You shouldn't be endorsing. And listen, the, the two major issues that Christians should care about, and, and there's three, but let me just deal with two, is the homo agenda and abortions. I mean, when it comes to social issues. The other issue that we should be concerned about is just this, this overwhelming, huge scope of government where government wants to run our lives and government wants to be our savior. You know, we ought to have limited government. I'm not an anarchist. I think there's, there's a place for government. I think God established government. But we don't need government just, just fixing all our problems and meeting all our needs. That's not scriptural. That's not biblical. You're there in Jeremiah, I think, or in Isaiah. Go to the book of Ezekiel. You got Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 9, look at verse 8. Ezekiel 9, verse 8. You say, why, why is the Sodomite agenda and abortion, why are those the two major issues? Here's why. Because according to the Bible, and I'm going to show it to you in the Bible, those are the two major sins that God will destroy and punish and judge a nation for. God doesn't judge a nation because they're filled with a bunch of liars. God doesn't judge a nation. I mean, there's sins that God judges individuals for, but when it comes to judging a nation, it's these two sins. Taking and shedding innocent blood and allowing perverseness to run rampant. Let me show it to you. Ezekiel chapter 9. Look at verse 8. You ought to underline these verses in your Bible or highlight them. Ezekiel 9. Look at verse 8. And it came to pass while they were slaying them. And I was left that I fell upon my face and cried and said, Ah, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel and thy pouring out of the fury upon Jerusalem? Look at verse 9. Then said he unto me, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great. He said, you've taken it too far. He said, it, it's, it's too much. Notice, what, what's the problem? What's exceeding great? And the land is full of blood. That's your abortions. And the city full of perver a perverseness. That's your sodomy. For they say, the Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. And as for me also, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. God says, I'm going to judge them. Here's why. Because of the shedding of blood and because of perverseness. And those are the two things that America and Hillary Clinton want to major on. Let the perverts and the homos have reign, and let's just kill as many babies as possible. Let's just fund Planned Parenthood and let them go crazy. You say, why, why should no Bible-believing Christian support it? Here's the question I want you to ask. Would Jesus Christ cast a vote, cast a ballot for Hillary Clinton when she's an abortionist baby killer, when she's an LGBTQ uh, champion? Let me give you another reason why you ought not vote for Hillary Clinton. And, and, and if you didn't like those two, you're really not going to like this one. Go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 3. Look at verse 12. Here's another, here's another reason you ought not vote for her. And this is going to be real complicated, okay? So I need you to listen very carefully. Because she's a woman. Amen. Oh, really? You're going to go there? Yeah, I'm going to go there. <laughs> Say why? Because the Bible goes there. Amen. Well, I can't believe that. Okay, well, look at what the Bible says. Isaiah chapter 3. Look at verse 12. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 12. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. This is talking about the judgment of God. 
It's not good. It's not, it's not the blessings of God to have a woman ruling over you, to have children ruling over you. It says, and women rule over them, O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the ways of thy path. God says he was judging them, and he says, you know what? I'm going to judge you, and I'm going to put a woman in charge. And I, I don't care if you don't like it. I don't care if you don't think it's right. It's not politically acceptable. The Bible says that women need to submit to the authority of men. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. I asked you to ple- keep your place there. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Pastor, don't you know this sermon's going to go on the... I, I, look, I don't care. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of these preachers and these Christians being scared to just say what the Bible says. Listen to me. I'm not Sean Hannity up here. I'm not Glenn Beck. I'm a Bible-believing preacher. I'm not going to sit here and tell you, well, Hillary Clinton, look, you, 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 and give you all these political reasons. Here was why you ought not vote for her. She's a murderer, she's a pervert, and she's a woman. That's why you ought not vote for her. 1 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12. But I suffer. The word suffer means allow. But I suffer not. He says, I don't allow a woman to teach. That's why a woman will never stand behind this pulpit to preach. Say, are you, are you just some sort of male chauvinist? Look, I think women are great. I married one. I think they're wonderful. My mom's one. I love my mom. My sister happens to be a woman. Okay? Here's the thing. I, it's not that women are different. It's just it, that, that they're terrible or they're bad. It's that God made women to have a different role than men. Period. Not that one's better than the other, but the Bible says very clearly, 1 Timothy 2, 12, but I suffer not a woman to teach. Someone should have quoted that verse to Joyce Myers. Nor, nor to usurp authority over the man, Hillary Clinton, but to be in silence. Somebody needs to tell her to just shut up. Just be quiet and quit usurping authority over the man. You say, why should no Christian vote? Why should no, let me, let me rephrase that. Why should no Bible-believing Christian who actually cares about what the Bible says vote for Hillary Clinton? Here's why. She's an abortionist. She's the LGBTQ proponent. And she's a woman. Say, I don't like those reasons. Well, then you don't like the Bible. Because I'm pretty sure I just proved all of that from the Bible. And here's the, problem with, here's the problem I have with most Christians is they don't really care what the Bible says. They've got their little agenda, their little brainwashing, their little thoughts, and you're not going to tell me otherwise. Look, the Bible will mess you up. You actually start reading it. <laughs> Why should you not vote for Hillary Clinton? I think I was clear. Let me, but you, you know, some of you are like, uh, well, you're, is this sermon, are you breaking the law? You're trying to you know, tell us all the bad things about Hillary so you can get Donald Trump election, elected. Okay, I'm glad you asked that question. Now let me give you some reasons why you should not vote for Donald Trump. <laughs> Why should you not vote for Donald Trump? And you know what? Independent Federal Baptists are just, are just falling all over themselves, just supporting this guy. And biblically and scripturally, Jesus would not cast a vote for him, and Jesus would not have you cast a vote. You say, prove that from the Bible. I'll prove that from the Bible, but before I prove that from the Bible, let me just go back to, to, to the two main points. On abortions. You know, be, here, here's, what, here's what everybody said. Well, Donald Trump is pro-choice, so therefore we have to choose him. Okay, here's the problem with Donald Trump being pro-choice. Donald Trump, I'm going to read for you an article, shocked attendees at the conservative CPAC conference in February 2011 when he declared himself pro-life after years of supporting the pro-abortion position. And by the way, that included partial birth uh, abortion. Several months ago, when questioned about his position, Trump responded by by, by saying the public will be surprised by his stance, and in an interview with Laura Ingram from Fox News leading up to the conference, Trump characterized himself as a pro-life, as pro-life and he repeated that apparent re- reversal when he told the audience of CPAC, I am pro-life. Now, you, what's CPAC? CPAC is this conference of conservatives every year where all these conservatives get together and they give each other speeches and Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and all these guys, they'll speak at CPAC. Let me explain something to you, all right? If Donald Trump was just pro-choice for years and years and years and years and years, and then like 10 years ago, he just said, you know what, I changed my mind, I'm pro-life, I'm pro, I'm against abortions, and then like 10 years later he tried to run for president, I would believe him. But when you're at CPAC, giving a speech, which if you go and listen to the speech on YouTube, He's basically explaining why people should support him because he's planning on running for president the next year. 
And then after that, after that uh, event, he, he just throws it out there. Oh, and by the way, I know I just told you I want to be the Republican nominee, and obviously the Republican platform is against abortion. So by the way, uh, I'm pro-life now. You know, you don't think that was motivated by, by political, by political motivation? You don't think he just said that? You, you know why he said that? Because he knows that all these dumb Christians are going to stand up and say, He's God's will for our life. He's pro-life. He's pro-life when it benefited him. He's pro- let, me, let, me, let me explain something to you. Did you know that Bill Clinton was pro-life when he was the governor in Arkansas? And when he became the Democratic candidate for president, he went to pro-choice. You know why he did that? Because none of these people have, have any integrity or character. They do whatever they need to do, and they say whatever they need to say in order to get elected. And here's a question I have for you. If, if Donald Trump is so pro-life, then what's his plan to end abortion? I've heard him say, on day one, we're going to change the Obamacare. On day one, we're going to do this. and we're gonna... What are you going to do about abortions on day one, Donald Trump? What, here's the thing. He's not going to do anything. None of them are going to do anything. You say, well, they gotta, he's got to put in the judges. The judges aren't going to change anything. That's the same thing we were told about George W. Bush. George W. Bush became president, had control, Republican control of both houses, and was able and allowed to put judges into the Supreme Court. And what did he do? Put one of the biggest liberals in the Supreme Court. Put one of the biggest anti-conservative judges. And, and Donald Trump's not going to get there and do anything. And by the way, this is, the, this is what's wrong with America. All these Christians, well, we've got to get the right judge in so they, uh, so they change the law. Here's the problem with that. Then another judge can just change that, number one. Number two, okay, now, please understand this. I did not graduate from the Rush Limbaugh Institute of Higher Learning, all right? <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that judges are not supposed to make laws. I'm pretty sure that the judiciary system is supposed to interpret law. And I'm pretty sure that the office of a president is not to make laws either. He's, an exe- he's in the executive. His job is to execute the law. The judge's job is to interpret the law. Congress is supposed to make laws. You know, here's the question I have. If all these conservatives want to end, why don't they bring, when they have control of both houses and the presidency, why don't they just pass a law? and make abortion illegal. Why don't they just pass a constitutional amendment? None of them do it. None of them have even tried. They just want to tell you they're pro-life. So you'll sit there and say, well, that's a Christian choice. You know what? Jesus taught that you got to back up what you say with words, with, with, with works. You can't just say something. You can't just tell people, here's what I believe. you got to show us. you got to do something. And I've not heard Donald Trump say anything other than, I'm pro-life. I'll defund Planned Parenthood. And when he's, he's talking about both sides of his mouth, he says he wants to defund Planned Parenthood, and then he's giving Planned Parenthood all these compliments and talking about how they're so great and all these other areas. So I don't think Donald Trump is going to do anything about abortions. I don't think any Republican is going to do anything about abortions. I don't think they really care. Right. I think they're just saying that to get you on board. What's he going to do about the sodomite agenda? Well, here's what Gregory Angelo said about Donald Trump. Gregory Angelo is the president of the Law Cabin Republicans a homosexual Republican group. Here's what he said about Donald Trump. Never before has a Republican presidential nominee so much as mentioned the LGBT community, let alone lavish such praises upon us. Talking about Donald Trump. Donald Trump said he's a champion for the LGBTQ community. Donald Trump said he will do everything in his power to help them and support them. So on those major issues, there's no difference. And let me just let you in on a secret. If you still think it's between the Republicans and the Democrats, no one's let you in on the joke. <laughs> you know what's funny? It's like Clinton's in power, Bush is in power, Obama's in power, Clinton, whatever, nothing changes. It's all the same. It's the same welfare program. It's the same warfare program. It's all the same thing. And we sit there and get all excited. Oh, this time it's going to be a Republican. Nothing changes. It's all the same. They never quit anything. They never stop anything. Abortions are still happening. The LGBTQ mafia is just getting stronger in this country, and Donald Trump's not going to do anything about it. And you say, well, I think he is. Okay, well, then let me give you some reasons why you should still not vote for him. Why Jesus would not vote for him. Are you there in 1 Timothy? Are you there in 1 Timothy? Before you go there, let me, let, go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Now, let me read for you a quote from Donald Trump. Donald Trump described himself as a very greedy person. These are his words. 
Now I tell you, I'm good at that. Talking about being greedy. So you know, I've always taken in money. He said in a rally in Iowa, I like money. I'm very greedy. I'm a greedy person. I should tell you that. He said, no, he says, I shouldn't tell you that. I'm greedy. I've always been greedy. I love money. Those are Donald Trump's words. Are you there in 1 Timothy 6? Look at verse 10. The love of money is the root of all evil. He said, I love money. The love of money is the root of all evil. What does that tell you about Donald Trump? He's an evil person. Because here's what that tells you. He'll do whatever he needs to do. He'll say whatever he needs to say. He'll give whatever lie he needs to lie if it'll help him become more powerful and get him, allow him to get more money. The love of money is the root of all evil is what the Bible says. Which while some coveted after have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through, through, through many sorrows. But here, here's what I want you to understand, okay? Keep your place there in 1 Timothy. Go to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter number 1. You got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Let me help you understand something. Did you know that in the Bible, God set up a Republican form of government? I'm not talking about the, Repu the Republican Party. A representative form of government? Do you know that he set up judges to represent the people? That's what America was founded on. And let, let me just help you out. America was not founded as a democracy. And that's what everybody, hey, we're a democracy, we're a democracy. Here's the problem with a democracy. It's one step away from socialism. Which is one step away from fascism and one step away from communism and one step away from every other ism. We were founded as a republic. I'm not telling you that that's great. or what, I'm just telling you that's how we were founded. You ever heard of the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the what? Republic, for which it stands. God established a republic form of government where there were judges who were uh, set uh, to represent the people. Let me show it to you. Deuteronomy chapter 1. Look at verse 13. Deuteronomy chapter 1. Look at verse 13. Now, you got to pay attention. Covetousness is the reason that Donald Trump should not be uh, endorsed by any Christian and would not be endorsed by Jesus Christ, Moses, God. I'll prove it to you. Deuteronomy 1.13 Take you wise men and understanding and know among your tribes and I will make them, notice, I will make them rulers over you. Do you see that? It's talking about leaders for the nation, political leaders. Look at verse 14. And he answered me and said, The thing which thou hast spoken is good for us to do. So I took the, notice, chief of your tribes, wise men and known and made them heads over you talking about rulers captains over thousands captains over hundreds and captains over fifties and captains over tens and officers among your tribes notice verse 16 and I charge your judges at that time saying hear the causes between your brethren and judge righteously between them every man and his brother and the stranger that is with him now notice what he says he says you hear the charges of the judges look at verse 17 you shall not respect persons in judgment but you shall hear the small as well as the great you shall not be afraid of the face of man for the judgment is God's notice what he says and the cause that is too hard for you bring unto me and I will hear it and I commanded you at that time all things which ye should do so here Moses is talking about this is how we set up the, the government we set up captains and rulers over thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens and you're supposed to judge them you're not supposed to have respect to persons and if there was a matter that was too hard then you bring that to me now go to the book of Exodus you're there in Deuteronomy just go uh, backwards into Exodus Exodus, second book of the, of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. In Exodus 18 is where these, this system, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, he's talking about this Republican form of government for the nation of Israel under the authority of God. Of course, God was their king, but the people were under the authority of these different rulers. In Exodus 18 is when this system was established. Notice what the Bible says. Exodus 18, verse 21. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God. Is that Donald Trump? Men of truth. Is that Hillary Clinton? Notice, don't miss this, underlining it in your Bible, hating what? Covetousness. God said, Moses said, when you pick leaders to rule the nation, make sure they hate covetousness. And you got Mr. Trump over here saying, I love money. I'm greedy. I shouldn't tell you that, but I'm greedy. And all these Christians. <laughs> Alex Jones said, Donald Trump is a David of our day. 
Don, Alex Jones said, Donald Trump is a godsend. Really? Because I'm pretty sure Moses wouldn't have voted for him. I, I'm pretty sure Jesus wouldn't have voted for him. I'm pretty sure they would have disqualified. I'm sure Jesus would have said, as soon as these words came out of his, his mouth, I love money, I'm sure Jesus would have said, I'm done with you. I mean, I, I mean, he would have been done with them a long time ago, but definitely at that point. Notice, don't, no, look, I know the Bible's going to mess you up. Look verse 22. And just so you know that he's talking about the same group of people. And let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee. Talking to Moses. But every small matter, and he goes on to talk about them. Now, you're, so, so would, would, would Donald Trump have been qualified to be one of the rulers of thousands, hundreds, or tens in the nation of Israel and God's government? The answer is no. Because he's covetous. Because by his own words, he loves money. He's a greedy person. And he's very proud of it. Go to Deuteronomy 17. Let me give you another example. Someone told me recently, we elect a, pres uh, we elect a king every, every four years. I, I'd agree with that. These people are basically kings. Here's what's interesting about that. God tells us how to choose a king. Did you know that? Deuteronomy 17. Let's look at it. Verse 15. We're going to choose a king on the fourth. Okay. Well, how would God have us choose a king? Deuteronomy 17. Look at verse 15. Deuteronomy 17. Verse 15. Thou shalt in any wise set him a king over thee. Talking about a political leader. Whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shall thou set king over thee. That thou mayest not set a stranger over thee. Which is not thy brother. But he shall not multiply horses to himself. Nor cause the people to return to Egypt. To the end that he should multiply horses, for as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Look at verse 17, Deuteronomy 17, 17. Neither shall he multiply wives to him. Donald Trump's on a third wife. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Here, here it is. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Would Donald Trump have been qualified to be the king of the nation of Israel? The answer is no. Because he's covetous. Because he's greedy. Because he said himself he loves money. The love of money is the root of all evil. No Christian ought to support Donald Trump. Because, he's a, because here's why. Because Jesus would not vote for him. Because Moses wouldn't vote for him. And if we're supposed to be patterning ourselves after Christ, then we ought not vote for him either. You say, well, I don't care about covetousness. You know what? Covetousness is a huge sin in the Bible. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Did you know that we're supposed to kick people out of church for being covetous? Did you know that? I never, I never knew that. Because you don't read the Bible, that's why. Because you go to churches that don't preach the Bible. Welcome to Verity Baptist Church. 1 Corinthians 5. Look at verse 9. 1 Corinthians 5. Look at verse 9. 1 Corinthians 5, 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle, not to company. Are we supposed to company with these people? Look, with fornicators. You see that? You know we're supposed to also kick out fornicators out of church? You're living together, you're not married, we're supposed to kick you out of church. You're shacking up and you're not married, we're supposed to kick you, kick you out of church. Not to company with fornicators, yet not all together with the fornicators of this world. He said, I'm not talking about the people in this world or with the covetous or with extortioners, or with idolaters, for them as ye needs go out of the world. But now I've written to you, not to company, if any man that is called a brother, someone who comes to church and says, I'm brother so-and-so, I'm sister so-and-so, I'm saved, I'm a believer. He said, Don't, he said not to comp keep company, if any man that is called a brother, be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. If Donald Trump tried to join this this church, we kick him out. We kick him out for being a covetous, fornicating, filthy person. He wouldn't be allowed to be part of Verity Baptist Church, and I'm supposed to vote for him for president. Jesus would not allow him to be part of his church, but Jesus would have me vote for him. It's ridiculous. Why should no Christian vote for Donald Trump? Because he's covetous. Why should no Christian vote for Donald Trump? Because he's he, because the other, here's the other thing, because he's vulgar. What are you talking about? All right, go, go, to, pro, go to Psalm, Psalm. Open up your Bible, just right in the center. I know, I already lost some of you, it's fine. Go to Psalm, Psalm 12, look at verse 8. Psalm 12, look at verse 8. You, you got to deal with the Bible. What is the Bible? I know that the conservative Christians today are just in love with Donald Trump. But you know what? 
My allegiance is to the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God that I was raised in a family where my dad and my mom taught me that my allegiance is to Jesus Christ before any country, before any group. My dad, I remember my dad telling me, you are a citizen of heaven before you are a citizen of any country. You're a citizen of heaven before you're an American. You're a citizen of heaven before you're Venezuelan. You're a citizen of heaven before you're... And he said, our allegiance ought to be to, be G- to Jesus Christ and to his people. And, and, he, and I remember being taught as a child. But I, I'm, I'm, I have more loyalty to believers in other countries than to the filthy homos in this one. And you say, you're not patriotic. Look, don't talk to me about being patriotic. I served the United States Air Force. I deployed. I fought. I did everything that you're supposed to do. And you know what? This country has let me down. They walked away from me. I mean, you, know, you got to be patriotic. You just got to vote for Donald Trump. You're insane. Jesus would not vote for him. He's wicked. He's covetous. And he's vulgar. Psalm 12, look at verse 8. The wicked walk on every side. And when the vilest men are, uh, when the vilest men are exalted, if you exalt a vile man, you know what's going to happen? The wicked will walk on every side. If you exalt a vile man, it's just going to get worse. Say, how's Donald Trump a, a, a wicked man? Just Google his name and listen to the things a man says. He, he talks about committing adultery with a woman while he's married. And, and, and saying she's married and he's going and he's gonna to commit adultery with her. And he's attempting to commit adultery with her. He's buying her all this furniture to try to get her in bed. He, he talks about walking up to random women and just start kissing them. And they let him because he's a star, because he's a celebrity. He literally, I mean, I can't even th- say the things he says. He talks about walking up to random women and just grabbing them from their private parts. And they'll just let him because he's, he's Donald Trump. And I'm supposed to believe Jesus would vote for this guy? Really? Answer that question. This guy's on record saying, I walk up to random women and just grab them from their private parts. But he's a Christian choice for America. You're insane. When the, when the wicked walk on every side, he said the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. I'm not going to exalt a vile man. Proverbs 29, look at verse 2. You're there in Psalms. Proverbs 29, look at verse 2. Proverbs 29, verse 2. Proverbs 29, verse 2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. You know what? On Wednesday of this week, no matter who gets elected, I will be mourning for America. Because either way, we're done. Either way, we're in trouble. Either way, well, he's pro-choice. He's not going to do anything about abortions. And if you think that, you know what? If I'll, I'll eat my hat, if Donald Trump becomes president and ends abortions, I will stand up here and say, you know what? He's still wicked. He's still covetous. But praise the Lord that he stopped abortions. But it's not going to happen. He's not going to do anything about it. He's not going to do anything about sodomy. He's not. He's a, he's vulgar. He's covetous. And let me explain to you, you know why most Christians, conservative Christians in America just don't care? They just look away with all these sexual things that he says? Here's why. Because most Christians in America are a bunch of perverts themselves. Most Christians in America are a bunch of fornicators themselves. A bunch of pornographers themselves. They think it's fine for them to shack up with someone they're not married to, so then it's fine for Donald Trump. You know what? God cares. It does matter. It does matter if he's moral. It do- and people say to me, well, you know, we're all sinners. You know what? We are all sinners. But you know what? We're not all, we're not all adulterers. We're not all covetous. We're not all vulgar. He would not be accepted in the government of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus would not vote for him, and I'm not going to vote for him either. He's vulgar. He's, he's covetous. Let me give you another one. He's proud. Proverbs 16, look at verse 5. Now, let me just say this right now. Does anybody want to stand up? And defend Donald Trump's humility? Anybody? Anybody want to stand up right now and say, no, you know what, you got him all wrong. He's a very humble man. I mean, even the people that support Trump say, yeah, he's real proud. He's the most arrogant man in America. He's the most proud man in America. Proverbs 16, look at verse 5. The Bible will mess you up. You start reading it. If you turn off Sean Hannity and start reading the Bible for a while. Proverbs 16, verse 5. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. 
Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Listen to me. Is Donald, proud, Donald Trump proud, yes or no? He would tell you that himself. Would the Lord vote for him? According to the Bible, he's an abomination to the Lord. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand joined in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Say, so why should we not vote for Donald Trump? Here's why you shouldn't vote for Donald Trump. He's covetous. That disqualified him from being king in Israel. That disqualified him from being a judge in Israel. Moses wouldn't vote for him. Jesus wouldn't vote for him. I'm not going to vote for him. Why should we not uh, 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 support Donald Trump? Because he's vulgar. Because he's a pervert. And when you exalt vile man, it'll just get worse for everyone else. Why should we not support Donald Trump? Because he's proud and arrogant. And by the way, all those things you think he's going to do, he's not going to do any of them. He's going to be LGBTQ's champion, just like Hillary is, and he's going to do nothing to stop abortions. You say, well, how do we stop abortions in America? You know how we stop abortions in America? We, we preach the Bible. Amen. We get people saved and in church, and we actually teach them what the Bible says. I was listening to uh, one of, uh, a preacher, Ch Chuck Baldwin. He, he was talking about how these two uh, different uh, um, surveys were taken, independent of each other. He just happened to come across them. I heard it on a radio program. He was talking about these two different surveys that were taken. One survey said that in 70% of pulpits in America, 70% of pulpits in America, abortion is never mentioned. The other survey, totally independent of, uh, uh, of the other, just a different survey altogether, said 70% of women that get abortions in America classify themselves as Christians. Isn't that interesting how those two numbers match? Maybe if preachers in America started preaching against abortion we'd basically get rid of abortion. At least bring it way down. Then maybe we could get, you know, if enough people want to do it, then these Republicans will have enough guts to actually try to do something about it. We shouldn't support him. He's not going to do anything about abortions. He's not going to do anything about the sodomites. He's covetous. He's vulgar. He's proud. Go to Psalm 143. Now, let me, Psalm 146. I'm going to be done here in a few minutes. So let me deal with some, some things that are often hurled at me when I preach these things or teach these things. Let me talk to you about the lesser of two evils myth. Everyone wants to tell me, well, he's the lesser of two evils. He's the lesser of two evils. Look, listen to me. If, you, if you've said that or you believe that, here's a question. I'm not mad at you, but can you answer this question? How far do you take the lesser of two evils? When will even the lesser one be too evil to support I mean, when, they're bo when both candidates are flaming homos, are we still supposed to just choose the one that's a little less homo than the other one? <laughs> when both candidates are just murderous, you know, murdering babies, are we just supposed to choose the one that's a little less murderer than the other one? I mean, people say, well, the less are too evil. You just admitted they're both evil. Well, how far do you take it? When do you cross the line? When does the lesser one get so evil that we can't even support him? I'll tell you when he got too evil for me, Donald Trump. I'll tell you when he got too evil for me, Mitt Romney. I'll tell you when he got too evil, all of these guys. I'm not going to sit there and support some satanic baby. You know, these people, they're all wicked. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. Let me tell you something. In order for someone to get as far as Donald Trump has gotten, he has to be controlled by the rulers of the darkness of this world. Amen. Period. I'm not going to align myself up with those people. So here's the question I have for the lesser of two evils crowd. When does lesser of two evils, when does that go too far? When does it go far enough where the, even the lesser one is too evil? And then here's what people say to me. Voting for the lesser of two evils, you've you got to vote. If you, if, you quit, if you don't vote, then you won't be heard. Here's the problem, and listen to me very carefully. Voting for the lesser of two evils sends a very clear message to both political parties. You know what that message is? Here's a message that Christians give every four years when they compromise their morals, compromise their principles, compromise their standards, and vote for people like Donald Trump. Here's a message they send to the Republican Party. Continue to give us terrible candidates. Continue to give us horrible candidates. Because we'll vote for them every time as long as they're a little better than the other guy. Or the other gal. And people say to me, well, if you don't vote, your message won't be heard. You know what? If enough Christians, 
If enough Christians said, I refuse to vote, if enough Christians stood up and said, I will not vote, I will not support Donald Trump, I will not support Mitt Romney, I will not support the Republican Party, I, if enough Christians abstained, you know what message it would send? It would send a message to the Republican Party or the Democrats or the Libertarians. Or the, here's the message it would send. We're not going to play your stupid game. We're not going to let you take advantage of us. And we're not going to support you till you give us a real candidate who's got some character, who's got some morals. We're not looking for someone that's perfect, but can you not give us a murderer and an adulterer and a covet? Can you give us someone who can at least be a member of our church? That's the message that it was said. But you know why we're losing? Because no matter what candidate they give you, you'll vote for them. No matter how lousy they are, as long as they're a little better than the other guy. Well, we got to vote. No, you're the problem. You're the reason America's the way it is. I, do you understand how many Christians there are in the United States of America? I mean, if all Christians said, I will not vote, that would send a clear, powerful message. But you know why? The next time, it'll just be just as bad because Christians all over America say, well, I don't want to vote for Donald Trump, but he's a little better than Hillary. It's ridiculous. I'm done with it. I am, I am making my voice heard by preaching this sermon. I am making my voice heard by abstaining from the presidential election. And Christians try to come up with all these stupid verses as to why they're supposed to vote. Let me, let me say this. Show me one verse in the Bible where I'm commanded to vote. Show it to me. The one verse in the Bible. And here's the one people always want to throw at me. Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. Hey, uh, newsflash, that's talking about paying tribute. Talk about paying your taxes. Read the Bible in its context. You, I think you ought to pay your taxes. Unless you want to end up like Kent Hovind. I think you ought to pay tribute to Caesar. That's not talking about voting. Show me one verse in the Bible that says it's my Christian duty to vote. You will not find it. But I can show you verse after verse after verse why no Christian ought to support Hillary Clinton, why no Christian ought to support Donald Trump, and why we're being brainwashed by the, the, the Sean Hannity's and the Rush Limbaugh's and the Glenn Beck's, and that's all the conservative Christian movement in America today. It's just, they're just parroting Sean Hannity. You got to vote for Donald Trump. You got to vote for Donald Trump. Why? Jesus wouldn't vote for him. I don't believe he would. Prove to me that he would from the Bible. Because I'll tell you this, Jesus would not vote for someone who's covetous. Jesus would not vote for someone who's vulgar. Jesus would not vote for someone who's proud. Jesus, and, and, and your two little things he thinks he's going to do, he's not going to do them anyway. Psalm 146. Look at verse 3. Psalm 146. Look at verse 3. Psalm 146 and verse 3. Notice what the Bible says. Put not your trust in princes. You know what a prince is? It's a political leader. It's a governmental leader. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. Let me explain something to you. The hope for America is not in a politician. Put not your trust in princes. The hope for America is not in the White House. The hope for America is not in Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump or any political candidate. The hope for America is in the Bible, in Bible-believing Christians, in preaching the Word of God. And you know what? You say, Pastor, why don't you preach more political sermons? Here's the problem I have with... I'm not saying most of these guys are like this because there's some guys that are fine people that I, I think are great. But you know what? These Christians, these John Hagee type that are all into politics... You know, these Christians that are all into politics, you know what bothers me about them? They're not into soul winning. If you want to save America, you should have been at soul winning yesterday. If you want to save America, you ought to go to the soul winning meeting on Thursday. If you want to save America, you ought to walk up and down your street preaching the gospel. The hope for America is the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not, you know, well, we got to get the government. You know, the government's going to do nothing. The hope for America is Bible-believing Christians preaching the gospel, getting excited, not about some wicked man or some wicked woman, but about the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. I don't believe, and you can't prove to me from the Bible, and you've, if you want to try to talk to me after service, let's go to all these verses. I'll have my notes, so let's go to them. You explain to me how it's okay to vote for Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. I don't believe any Christian who actually believes the Bible 
can cast their vote for either one of these two fools. Say, you're not supposed to call people fools. They, you know, they're going to die and go to hell. That's a problem. You cannot vote for these two people and have a clear conscience before God. Well, you got to vote. No, I don't. No, I don't. And I wish Bible-believing Christians would just quit and say, we're sick of your game. We're sick of being taken advantage of. We're not. We're going to stand together. And listen to me. I'm not saying you ought not vote. There are some propositions you, maybe you should get educated on and vote for. I'm not saying you should never vote. I'm just saying this presidential election, 2016, it, there's no way a Bible-believing Christian could cast a vote for Donald Trump and be right with God. Look at the Bible. There's no way a Bible-believing Christian could cast a vote for Hillary Clinton and be right with God. Say America's going to go down the tube. America needs to go down the tube. You know, maybe if Hillary Clinton becomes president and ruins our, our, our economy, maybe enough people will get humbled to where they'll come back to God and they'll get saved and they'll get their lives right with God. Yep. Yeah. God's more interested in seeing people saved than he is in the Republican Party. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that the sermon would be taken in the spirit in which it was given. And Lord, I realize that most churches today, they are not preaching the Bible. And most churches today think it's godly to line yourself up with the Republican Party. But the truth of the matter is, it's not. And Father, I pray that there will be people who walk out of this church service this morning who say, I was going to vote for Hillary, I was going to vote for Donald, but now I'm not. And Lord, I pray that a movement would start over the, the, the entire country where true Bible-believing Christians would say, you know what, I'm done playing your game. I'm done letting you take advantage of me. I'm not just going to vote for the, the guy who's a little better than the other guy. And Lord, help us to send a clear message to Washington. That we're not going to support their wicked, filthy candidates. And we're not asking for someone who's perfect. But if there's someone who loves God and who loves liberty and who doesn't want to kill babies and who's not a pervert, we'd get behind them. But that's not Donald Trump. That's not Hillary Clinton. Lord, I pray you'd help us to be mindful of the things the Bible says. Help us to ask the question this, this Tuesday, who would Jesus want me to vote for? In your precious name I pray. Amen.